I had another full-time job. I used to work as a line producer in advertising. It's like a very niche job in commercials, basically making TV commercials. And I would do that freelance and I do this on the side. And yeah, I basically was like, came up with six shirt designs like at night, working with my buddy Drew to like design it. And yeah, like just very like scrappy, figuring out how to make t-shirts and all that stuff, yeah. What was your first step? Was it social media or did you go ahead and try to partner up with some of the local golf shops, maybe a mix of both? What was the first- Oh, thing to, get it, to get it launched? Yeah. Yeah, so I had a hundred polos, a Shopify store. And to get it out, I remember the first day I put it live, I like posted on my own social and it was like, my mom, my friend, I was just his best man at his wedding, someone I was working with on set that day. And like, it was like that for like the first two weeks. But then what I did is I remember I got home the night I launched and I sent DMs to like five golf influencers um, who I'd been following that were kind of like, you know, like hole in one trick shots, Coach Rusty, mm. the Butsy. I don't know if you guys follow golf Instagram world, but all those guys at that point, they really hadn't been sponsored. And even three years ago, it was a totally different game. on like influencer marketing, but they all were like, these are dope. Send us uh, some polos. So I sent them some polos and they just posted it like wearing it. And I remember the first day, uh, one of the guys posted, I sold like seven polos and I was like, oh shoot, what are these? Like, uh, that that's working. And so basically let's say I sent it, I gave it to a bunch of those guys. They sold maybe 30 polos from just posting and wearing and people commenting. Wow. And the thing with bad birdie is like, if you wear it on a course, probably like an 80% chance someone's going to be like, Hey man, where's your shirt from? Mm -hmm. And so we probably sell like every four shirts we sell, we probably get like one to two organic sales from it. So I think it just kind of started growing. And then, yeah, basically just kind of that initial push. I kept those guys stocked with polos for the first little bit, but then it just kind of became a word of mouth thing. And I was selling, I think I sold like $4,000 in the first month, which is probably around 50, 60 polos, which isn't bad at all, but it's also like yeah, not that great. many polos. Right, right. Just so. the beginning. And then what are the semblances? You're getting a bunch of market signals. And then at some point you decide to say, hey, let me apply on to Shark Tank and see what this is like. Well, yeah. I mean, actually, no, not at all. It's, I, I started Bad Birdie with the sole goal to like buy a house in LA and maybe make a couple extra grand a month to pay for a mortgage. That was my whole okay. goal is like, I want to start a business as a side hustle. I love like I like doing being a producer fits my strengths. I love that I get to travel around the world, do like, you know, the glitz and glam. I mean, it's not really glitz and glam with filmmaking, but like I got to just do a bunch of cool projects and work with a bunch of cool brands. And um, I loved it, but I was like, Hey, I could start a business on the side. I like playing golf. So for the first year, like I was just always on, honestly, for the first year and a half, like I did it for a year. I was like, I'm gonna see if I can sell a thousand shirts in a year. I sold like a thousand and ten. And then the next year I remember I went on the trip and I was like, Hey, my, my current employee now who's grown a ton was, he was like shipping for me. He started shipping. It was still a small side hustle. I was like, hey man, can you kind of run my side hustle, handle customer service and the shipping? I still was thinking like, we're doing like $4,000 a month, maybe 6,000, 7,000 if it was good. I was still thinking this was a side hustle. A year and a half into it, my buddy was like, dude, you should just meet with these guys in Miracle Mile. These guys like are wealth advisors, like just pitch them idea, just or like just kind of hear what, let them kind of hear what you're working on. It was just kind of like a soft intro. So I went and met with these guys strictly to kind of get some advice or here they work with a bunch of clients and they were all like, oh yeah, when this thing's a $20 million company, when this thing's a $50 million company, I was like, what? Like it was this big shift for me where I was sitting in this, like on like the 40th floor in Miracle Mile in LA, the top, like I was like, and these guys were just like talking to me like, oh yeah, you're going to be a, you'll do a million next year. Then you'll do 5 million and then 20. And I was like, what? I never really thought this was more outside of my um, apartment. So that was the first shift that kind of was like, I could try to raise money. I could try to just keep grinding it out. Like there's potential here where people that see other entrepreneurs work with them on a daily basis. There's no question in their mind that this could be a, a legit company. And so, yeah, did that for, that was like maybe like, yeah, that was like a year and a half in. And then a year after that, I got hit up by Shark Tank casting. Um, I didn't apply to the show. I've watched that show for 10 years. Like when I was living in the, the place where I started it, I had three other roommates and every Saturday morning, I'm an early riser. I'd get up and be like watching Shark Tank at like 7 a.m. from the night before <laughs> on Hulu. Yeah. And they'd always give me crap about it. They'd be like, yo, dude, why, why is you always watching Shark Tank? I'd always be like, oh, Jason, why don't you pitch us your fake Shark Tank product? Like it was always like this inside joke, kind of like they were all like sleeping in, you know, from the night before we were in our 20, you know, 
going out and stuff. And I would just like get up early and like watch Shark Tank and be like, okay, like critiquing like the, or like thinking about the pitches, but I never had any idea to go on the show. And then I think it was 2019, the beginning of last year, I got a email from casting. It was like, Hey, I work with casting for Shark Tank. My husband's a golfer. I saw your company. I'd love to talk to you about coming on the show. I mean, that's about how they get half of their people. And so basically went through that process, filmed it last September. So you film it and they're like, all right, it could air anytime. It may or may not air and it can film anytime. It could air between October and like May. And so for me, I was like, shoot, I hope it doesn't air in like November or December when it's like the worst season for golf because it's like sure. freezing. So it aired perfect time, April, I think third this year. And it was just honestly perfect timing, like beginning of golf season, just after the initial bump of COVID when everyone's freaking out and people actually like were super supportive. So yeah, that's a long winded answer, but. No, I, and I love, I mean, one of the things I watched the clip and one of the, I don't know if you thought to do this, it's, you probably did given the fact that you're waking up at 7am and critiquing, but just the yeah. fact that you had Robert, you made it, you made it like whatever, it's, it's what we do on the course, right? You're like, all right, yeah. put, put for dough, here we go. Right. It's like, let's do it. Yeah. And you made him earn, or I guess you kept 5% of your company because Robert missed his yeah. cut. Amazing. Did you, I mean, you had that in the back of your head the whole time. You were like, this is what's going to go down. Yeah. If yeah. Offer. Yep. So prior to the show, I did like a, a session with like all the business guys I know. I had like four or five buddies come over to my place and it was like, all right, guys, this is like training. I've, I have like every question and, you know, I gave them all my financials, everything. I was like, come to me with any questions. And like, they basically during that, during the prep, they were talking about, they're like, dude, you know, all your financials and stuff. Like, what are you going to do when they negotiate with you? Hmm. And one of my buddies, Blake, who was actually my, like, I used to work for him. Uh, he's a couple of years older. And um, he was like, dude, you got to kind of figure out a way to negotiate with him on the spot. So he came up with the idea, which I always give credit for to him. He's like, dude, you got to figure out a way to like kind of bait them. Or if you can't negotiate, like, am I going to really be able to negotiate with a shark? Like I could try to, but I don't know. It's kind of tricky. I think like <laughs> I could be like, I wanted to get a deal. So he was like, dude, you should do something with putting. And so basically kind of came up with that idea, pitched it to the producers prior to the show and was like, Hey, if it comes down to it where I want to be able to do this. Can I do it? They're like, yeah, totally. It's cool. There's 0% staging on that show. Like you literally, they're like, if you walk in and fall, like we're not going to stop pulling the cameras. The only time we'll <laughs> stop pulling the cameras is if like one of our, there's a technical issue, but they're like, yeah, you do what you want. You can make him putt. You can do whatever. So I had it set up in the back of my mind. If I got to that spot where I was like, I mean, you guys saw me in the show. I was like, okay, how about 20, 20%? He's like, no. I'm like, uh, okay. Well, like the putt was perfect. It was the perfect fit for that. But if I didn't have that, I would have just been like, uh, I, right. I didn't know. Like, I, I just am not very good at negotiating. And I think I should have like, in hindsight, I like walked out. I was like, man, that putt saved my ass. But if it, if I hadn't done that, like I just would have been like, okay, sure. 25%. Yeah, for I sure. Don't know, I don't know how it would have gone, but yeah. Cause you got some of the leverage back. Yeah. And it was just like, it's totally like bad birdie style, you know, bait your buddy on the course and it comes like an inch short. I mean, it was like the perfect ending. So. Yeah. My favorite part of that was it happens to us all on the course, you know, we're more confident and cocky than we actually have skill to back up most of the time. But yeah. when Robert misses the putt and then Kevin O'Leary comes in, he's like, let me show you how it's done. And then he misses yeah. the putt afterwards as well. It's yeah. just that that perfect showmanship ahead of time. And then, oh, maybe, maybe I uh, overspoke yeah. afterwards. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out that clip. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit the like button down below. And if you're interested in hearing the full episode, it's out right now on our YouTube channel. We've had a lot of great guests come on this show before, and we've got a lot of great guests coming up in the future. So hit subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. And one final note, we're always looking for new ideas and new companies to feature on the show. So if you know of someone or know of a company, write us a comment down below letting us know who they are and what they do. We'd be happy to have them on the show. Till then, I'll just be here waiting for your comments. So, uh, see you later.